Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Lisa, for your leadership on this and really a terrific day and all the participants. So uh, I thought I'll quickly outline what we're planning to do, then introduce the uh, three presenters. And uh, we are looking forward to questions from you all. So we're keeping our presentation short. And we'll do the three presentations and then we'll uh, open it up for questions. So. Uh, each presenter will speak for about seven to eight minutes. We've asked them to share a personal story of their uh, own journey uh, with lessons learned, how uh, that might help others on the call or inspire you to ask questions uh, on how we might enhance collaborations in New Mexico in the biosciences area, uh, including how to support inclusive excellence and inclusive impact. Uh, we'll, I've asked them to end with a few key points that they think will help us all expand innovation and entrepreneurship, economic development in the biosciences here in New Mexico. That should leave us open for about 15, 20 minutes of questions. And uh, <clears throat> thank you all for uh, being part of this. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> a quick introduction of myself. I'm the executive vice president for the health sciences here at UNM, which is the School of Medicine and the three colleges of uh, nursing, pharmacy, and population health. I'm also CEO of the UNM Health System. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Arora is the director and founder of Project ECHO, which is both the New Mexico focused and global impact program, uh, which aims to uh, democratize the implementation of best practices in underserved areas and make an inclusive impact. Uh, Project ECHO originated in New Mexico and has been replicated by more than 600 academic organizations in the world and more than 3 million participants in 180 countries have been mentored on these ECHO uh, networks. He has received numerous prestigious awards in educational innovation and uh, ECHO could help many in biosciences and beyond. Uh, Dr. Dale Decker is an architect and planner. He is the founding principal of DPS, which is Decker, Perrick, and Sabatini, an Albuquerque-based design firm with offices in Amarillo, Las Cruces, and Phoenix. Uh, DPS currently employs over 190 employees. He also serves as chair of the New Mexico Bioscience Authority. Uh, he has extensive experience in high-tech, one-of-a-kind research facilities for Sandia, uh, award-winning school designs, and <clears throat> socially responsible designs for uh, assisted living facilities for the elderly. Uh, he's helping us with inclusive urban landscape for smart cities, which includes sensors and broadband, which is critical to the biosciences. Uh, Dr. Juanita Tuttle is managing partner of Tramway Venture Partners. Uh, she has a PhD in biology and an MBA, both from the University of New Mexico. Dr. Tuttle started Tramway Venture Partners in 2017 and Tramway Venture Partners 2 in 2020. Uh, both funds make early stage investments in life sciences and healthcare, and they're critical for uh, our bioscience uh, economy and development of new businesses. Uh, her career involvement has been extensive and she's uh, uh, been critical in the development of bioscience industry here in New Mexico, particularly Albuquerque. And we look forward to her unique and valuable perspective on where we've been and where we're headed. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna uh, open up with our first presenter, Dr. Aurora. But thank you, Doug, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Lisa, for this opportunity. Um, my name is Sanjeev, and I, um, I'm a gastroenterologist by profession. And I've uh, lived in New Mexico since 1993. Uh, proud to be here. In uh, 2001, um, I had gone into my clinic at the University of New Mexico, and there was a 43-year-old woman sitting there. And along with her was two children in the room, a 14 year old boy and a nine year old girl. And um, I asked her, how can I help you? And she said, I have hepatitis C and I want treatment. 
So I, I said, how long have you had it? And she said, I've had it for eight years. My next question to her was, why did you not come earlier for treatment if you've uh, known about it for eight years? And she said, I'd call your clinic. There was an eight month wait to see you. And there was, uh, um, I lived 200 miles away and there was no one in my area. There were no specialists who could treat this disease. And I'm a single mother and there was no way I could drive 200 miles each way. And your nurse told me that you would have to come 12 times. So I decided not to get treatment. And I asked her then, why did you come today? And she said, I'm having pain here in the right upper side of my abdomen. And I did an ultrasound of her abdomen and found she had a cancer of her liver, which was now really not curable anymore. We couldn't resect it. We couldn't do a liver transplant. And essentially she passed away six months later, leaving these two children. And I was asking myself, why did she have to die when we knew how to treat her? We had the medicines, we had all the diagnostic tests where she lived. And the answer was she died because the right knowledge didn't exist at the right place at the right time. And that's why I started ECHO in 2003, because there were 28,000 patients like her. The Department of Health had, her, had their names already. They had been diagnosed, but when less than 1,500 had been treated, we anticipated 8, 9,000 would die without treatment. So we thought, okay, we should figure out a way to get treatment to everyone. And ECHO was based on four key ideas. And some of this is going to be applicable to how we bring up bioscience entrepreneurs in New Mexico. But the four key ideas in this case for hepatitis C was first to use technology to leverage expertise. And that time, Zoom wasn't around, but we used one to many video conferencing to leverage the expertise of a specialist like me and a psychiatrist. The second key idea was to share best practices. And I went around the state of New Mexico and I set up 21 new treatment sites for hepatitis C because not a single primary care doctor in New Mexico was treating it and they weren't specialists. And I gave them my protocol, but not a single one of them was willing to treat. They said, look, this is too toxic. This is chemotherapy. We can't give this. We weren't trained to do it. So I asked myself, how did you become an expert in treating hepatitis C? And when I did my fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts, I would see a patient and present to my professor. I would see another one present to my professor. And after two years, they started calling me a gastroenterologist. So I said, aha, I'm going to use this model. We call it iterative guided practice and case-based learning in which all teach, all learn. We would use this model to create new hepatitis C specialists or experts in New Mexico. And in 2003, I started my first echo clinic once a week, Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m., where all 21 would join and present cases to each other once a week. And we would discuss about eight patients. I'd give them a brief lecture. And what we found was that in 12 months, they became absolute experts because they learned from us. They learned from each other. They learned by doing. And the wait in my clinic in 18 months fell to two weeks. And the cure rates were really high. We did a lot of research, showed that ECHO was building communities of practice, reducing professional isolation, increasing satisfaction. And we published in the leading medical journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine, that these rural clinicians could provide the same level of care as us and give chemo as long as they were participating in ECHO. Once we did that, now the question was almost... Six billion people in the world don't have access to the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. How do we solve this bigger problem? So we started using ECHO in New Mexico for diabetes, for addiction, for mental health, for rheumatology, chronic pain, and so on and so forth, and launched 20 projects. But because the problem is so large in the world, we decided that we would democratize our technology platform, our know-how on how to do ECHO, we had a repository of resources that we shared freely, and we started training every major university in the world to do ECHO. We trained University of Washington, then Chicago, then Harvard, Johns Hopkins, MD Anderson. Currently, we have more than 600 hubs operating out of more than 55 countries. We do ECHO for about 70 disease areas. And as you heard from Dr. Zidonis, uh, we have mentored about 3 million healthcare professionals all over the world. More recently, about five years ago, we started working in the field of education because we found that 
in New Mexico and in many, many states. For example, in New Mexico, only 25% of children can read at the third grade level. That is a disaster, as, as I don't need to explain why. And so we started ECHO for school teachers. We have now, uh, we have many, many ECHO projects for school teachers, including social and emotional learning, uh, literacy, uh, school principal leadership, et cetera. And ECHO has now grown outside of healthcare into climate change and other, other areas. Let me focus now on how ECHO could be used uh, uh, for the purpose of this meeting. I think that uh, for bringing up bioscience entrepreneurs in New Mexico, ECHO can be a very helpful tool in having an ECHO just for bioscience entrepreneurs. So what, what would we discuss? We would discuss in what we call all teach, all learn, let's say we had 20 of them, on how to write grants, how to write an effective grant. We could discuss how to access publicly available resources. We could discuss how to connect with other experts and mentors. We could bring experts from places like Stanford and the Silicon Valley to actually participate in these mentoring sessions for our entrepreneurs. We could talk about how to connect with venture capitalists. We could talk about um, how to use the internet to get their messages out and so on and so forth. There are so many, there are entrepreneurship courses in these larger universities and, and we, we could basically, what ECHO's primary methodology is guide case-based learning and guided practice. So we could actually take the cases of an individual entrepreneur and mentor them in this all teach, all learn format. The other way ECHO can be helped and we would be delighted to collaborate with this group to launch an ECHO for entre entrepreneurs in bioscience. The second area that I think for, in, for us to attract large business and businesses to New Mexico, we need a good healthcare system and a good education system. And ECHO is working on both of those areas. We have a desire to expand it so that every school teacher in New Mexico can be mentored. And we have the technology, the platform and everything we need. And similarly, everybody in New Mexico can get better healthcare. I'll stop here and thank you again, Doug, for the opportunity. Great, thank you, Sanjeev. <clears throat> and so now um, I'd like Dr. Decker to be able to present. I don't know how we'll adjust the technology. So he's the focus, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Doug, for elevating me to the level of doctor. Actually, uh, I'm an architect and a planner, but uh, I'll take uh, any kind of uh, elevated degrees that I can get. I recognize an awful lot of people on this call today, and that's really, um, reassuring because this ecosystem, these participants that are part of this are part of the solution, obviously, and part of that innovation ecosystem that's going to drive our state in the future. By way of background, uh, I grew up in Albuquerque. I grew up near the University of New Mexico. I spent many uh, uh, hours at Johnson Gym uh, playing basketball and uh, lifting weights and one of my best friends, his father was the head of the geology department. So I have a long affiliation with the University of New Mexico and, and what's being done there and really appreciate Lisa's leadership in pulling this together, the summit. But, you know, I, I'm here today really to, to talk about opportunity and biosciences is clearly one of those opportunities. It was identified as one of the major clusters in the economic development strategy that EDD just put together. But my interest in economic development really has to do with what is the process? How do we pull people together in our state to, to focus, but also to move in unison in a direction to really help all New Mexicans thrive? And by way of background, also, I'd like to just kind of give you a little bit of insight into why these processes kind of work. Um, and several years ago, I was involved with a group that was putting together a proposal for a, mini, a manufacturing innovation hub around directed energy and optics and photonics. And it was through that effort that I really learned the depth and breadth of the 
groups within our state, that if we could just pull them together, there's just tremendous resources, tremendous assets, tremendous intellectual capital um, that could really help accelerate our state moving forward. Five years later in 2015, a very similar approach was used. Uh, Mathis Shinnick was our lead investigator and the person that pulled together a group around the biosciences and we developed a grow bio study. Uh, again, looking at biosciences in the context as an economic driver for our future. And as a result of that report came the uh, idea of a bioscience authority, uh, which is housed at the University's uh, Bioscience Center of Excellence and is affiliated there. And, it, and I think it sets the framework for how our state can really move forward uh, collectively and in unison to focus on really emerging areas of technology and opportunities for all New Mexicans, entrepreneurs, innovators, and we, we are building that ecosystem as we talk. So that's kind of my background, my interest as chair of the Bioscience Authority. Uh, we have very specific things that we're working on. And again, this is, um, I'm gonna show you my PowerPoint slide. It's actually out of the study. And it's our job at the Bioscience Authority and the Center of Excellence to turn all of these yellow and red dots into green dots. And the SIR, uh, the Stanford Research Institute study is very well done, I think, in defining what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities are to grow that industry. And one of the other things too, if you do ever download the 407 page report, here's another uh, slide and you'll notice this is uh, from a demographic point of view, not such a good thing for New Mexico where 38% of the population growth between 2010 and 2019 was in the 65 plus group. And we actually had an out migration of millennials. And so we, I, the focus of the report and the SRR report, looking at these clusters to diversify our economy, provide those opportunities to keep people here, families, and uh, develop the talent within our university system to keep them here is gonna be critical. So, you know, I'm gonna kind of stop there and let the, the next person talk, but just one other quick thing. You know, why bioscience is a good, uh, industry to grow in New Mexico. Just some facts to consider. In New Mexico, bioscience uh, patents are the leaders with over 325 between 2011 and 2020. Uh, New Mexico is seventh in the nation in bioscience patents per capita. Uh, so we've got the workforce. We have the intellectual capability and capacity to do that. They're high salaried jobs, 70%. However, 70% of New Mexico bioscience graduates have to leave our state to get jobs. And in those six areas, which we're gonna hear more and more about is the biosciences, the industries that make up the bioscience sector, agricultural feedstock and chemicals, bioproducts, biofuels, uh, as used in carbon sequestration, bioscience related distribution, drugs and pharmaceuticals, uh, with the supply chain issues and reshoring opportunities. I think our state's got a great opportunity there. Medical devices and equipment, which we also, the pandemic kind of showed um, some of the, the issues around that critical infrastructure, re research and bioinformatics, testing and medical laboratories. Um, we've got it here in New Mexico, we can build it. And the SRI report, that EDD is commissioned, I think gives us a good sense of where we can take it. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks, Dale. Uh, Dr. Tuttle. Hello. Here I am. And I think I have everything turned on or change the way it needs to be. I'm thrilled to be on a panel with Sanjeev Aurora and Dale Decker. Oh my goodness. Sanjeev, I remember the first time we met in the early 1990s as one of our company startups uh, had some interest in hepatitis C and I can, I remember, <laughs> I remember that so clearly. Uh, and so here we are uh, a few years later, uh, but still plugging along and, and excited about that. I've 
had the opportunity in more recent years to work with Dale uh, with some of our common interests in technology development and financing uh, in particular. So what I thought might be useful this morning is to pick up on a topic that John Clark mentioned this, this morning in highlighting some of the findings of the SRI report. And one per, in particular was that we have within the region the lowest per capita investment in venture capital. And since I am now in venture capital today, I thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit about the story of how I got here and some lessons learned and what I think is maybe some real opportunities uh, for us ahead from the venture capital perspective. So if we rewind the clock back to the mid 1970s, I was a newly minted PhD in biology, concentration in respiratory physiology, and uh, was hired as a research scientist at uh, what was then called the Lovelace Medical Foundation, which was the holding company for the multi-specialty group practice, CHMO, and an independent research operation a big part of which is uh, became the Inhalation Toxicology Research Institute, and now you know it is the Loveless Respiratory Research Institute. And so uh, there I was and perking along, and because of some organizational changes, at, and I will say at a very young age, so you can don't count the decades too quickly, um, I landed in a management position leading the clinical research division, which had responsibility for the funded research programs of the foundation related to the practice of medicine. And uh, that was a very exciting time. Uh, I'll fast forward a little bit. By 1992, there were some more reorganizations underway at Loveless, and the entrepreneurial bug had bit. I was very excited about what really happens with new knowledge and how it gets into practice. And one of the major ways, not the only one, but then one of the major ways is through commercialization. And you know, it was clear to me even back then and everybody knew that we were just awash in technology in New Mexico, but had very little business infrastructure really targeted at moving that uh, forward into a commercial setting. So we had created a small subsidiary of Loveless at the time. And I ended up leaving in 1992. Um, and I should back up and say, because it is part of the story, it's part of the UNM story that um, my one of my mentors back at Loveless had said to me, you need to go get an MBA so you can understand the language of business. And so I did that. Uh, so that was the Anderson School of Management, a, a great time. It took me four years because I was doing it nights and Saturdays. With two, I had two little kids by that time. and uh, But it was an exciting time. So 1992, I left and formed a company, um, still exists today, Southwest Medical Ventures, which has become a, was and still is a vehicle for entrepreneurial activities. And, and during the period from 1992 to about 2016, uh, was a co-founder of five startup companies. Uh, and that process was one of identifying a really exciting technology. And, and then those days, all of it local and uh, really beginning the first building of a business plan, uh, finding the success of management team and finding most importantly, the capital to invest. Let me tell you, it may seem like we don't have a lot of venture capital around today, but you should have seen in 1992 what that looked like, uh, but in an exciting time. And so, and then fast forwarding again, in 2017, uh, the New Mexico Catalyst Fund was formed and there was really an opportunity for the first time to uh, step forward and look at managing a fund that would actually do investments. And so that was the founding of Tramway Venture Partners One, Fund One. Uh, this is a true collaboration, public and private. Uh, the New Mexico Catalyst Fund, it's, it's thought that the Catalyst Funds are just entities under the Catalyst Fund, but actually the New Mexico Catalyst Fund is a limited partner in each of the funds in which, so it's a fund of funds. And for, in our case, it's only 40% of our funds. So the rest of it was private capital that was raised. And then in 2020, believe it or not, in the middle of the pandemic, we were able to close on Tramway Venture Partners too. 
And uh, that one, that fund, uh, it's not a catalyst fund, but the New Mexico State Investment Council through its Emerging Managers Program, which is focused on building a sustainable venture capital in industry in New Mexico, was our, our leading limited partner. So what can we do in the future? Uh, you know, it, there's a phrase, it takes a village. Well, it also takes a long time, but I think we have come through a long maturation process and are really at a point where we can really grow the venture capital industry in New Mexico. I can tell you that from the formation of our fund one in 2017 to the uh, formation of fund two in late 2020, the um, number of opportunities deals as they're called in the parlance to invest in uh, has probably quadrupled. Uh, I haven't sat down to count it, but we were seeing maybe one investable opportunity a quarter, and now we're seeing uh, that many every week. Uh, so it's, you know, they don't all fit, but the activity has just burgeoned uh, over the last three years. Uh, you know, I think in terms of looking at growing venture capital itself, a lot of pieces, but I think a, a training, and I was really excited about uh what Sanjeev had to say about applications of ECHO, both to entrepreneurship, but I think also perhaps on the venture capital side, I mean, there is a set of, of skills and knowledge around just investment management that are unique to venture capital. They're related to entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity, but they're, they're different. And we just got, I mean, I'm looking every day for the person that can join us uh, next in these funds. So I think we can look at some opportunities there. We can look at more opportunities to co-invest with uh, funds from out of state. Uh, and then most importantly, we can have some successes. And I'm excited about the prospect of doing that. I think something, three things all of us can do. Uh, the one is to encourage a culture that values bold thinking for one, risk tolerance for another. That means saying it is okay to fail because the failures will come and to actually truly believe that we have opportunity ahead for us. And I'll just finish up by circling back um, to the SRI correct citation of our being, you know, the last on the list in terms of venture capital investment per capita can tell you also that we're number one on a whole lot of lists. And for example, not just in the region, but in the nation for R&D intensity. So that gap between R&D intensity and venture capital per capita, that is a gap that has another name in the venture capital world and its opportunity. Uh, and I think we're, we're ready and poised to take advantage of that gap. So that's the, that's the cup half full finish to that. Thank you, Doug. Great, thanks. Um, so I don't know if there's a way to put the three panelists up in one view. Uh, I know we did it before. Uh, I'm gonna start with questions that came into the chat and encourage anybody who wants to put some questions in for the panelists to put them in. Uh, so first question uh, goes to uh, Sanjeev. Uh, and I just want to also acknowledge, you, you know, in the in the chat, people said, you know, you ought to win a Nobel Prize. Well, you ought to win a Nobel Prize for all the great work you're doing. And also one of the themes of today was social determinants of health and ACEs. And I think it's, I hope it's important for this state to realize the power of your technology and uh, best practices so that they can see, you know, education and public safety, which has been raised by others, and how those will be important ingredients, uh, not only for improving health, but economic development in this state. So uh, the first question is, how can ECHO be used for economic development? Well, thank you, Doug. And thank you all for your kind words in the chat. I think that um, economic development is a multifactorial thing in my perspective. Of course, education and health is important. But I've often thought that what if we had an echo for uh, economic development specifically where, you know, we have 33 counties, each has an economic development group. We have the executive branch. They have an economic development group. What if we started an echo specifically for economic development 
to share best practices. We, uh, that's a core principle of ECHO. We call it all teach, all learn. Amongst these different counties, helping, you know, there are so many grant opportunities right now. Could we have grant writing expertise in there? Could we share expertise from other states that have done um, good economic development in rural areas? And could we help each county develop solutions which are absolutely appropriate for their particular area? So that in addition to the echoes we are planning to do in science and math, which are we are going to be launching soon and literacy and um, school principal leadership and all of these, I can all together. Another area that I have a particular interest in for someone who's interested in doing this is starting an echo for small businesses, not just for entrepreneurs, but small businesses across the New Mexico, if given an opportunity to be mentored uh, in, and it could be problems related to accounting or marketing or using the internet for uh, the social media. Um, all of these are highly uh, developed skills. And if we were to democratize their implementation, helping these businesses uh, solve these problems in their local communities, I think we can do a lot of economic development that way. So I'll stop there, Doug, so that there's room for other people to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Second question goes to Dale. Uh, Dale, uh, you might reflect on your ideas that you were starting to present for a center of excellence at UNM, but the question was really around one university and how could UNM do a better job of leveraging their different schools of medicine, engineering, computer science, business management. Um, since I've gotten here, I'll just spend one minute on that. We, uh, UNM 2040, the new strategic plan is including a focus on one university. So I really appreciate uh, James Gover's comment. Uh, I think about it every day in my role uh, just this morning, we were talking about pipeline programs across all those uh, uh, different schools and colleges, how we increase our IPE for students. Uh, our College of Population Health is moving towards a school of public health, and the president and the provost and I are charging a group to meet regularly. Uh, our new center of excellence at uh, Sandoval Regional Medical Center on orthopedics, uh, it was vital to have partnerships with engineering uh, the grand challenges bring people across the campus. But if we <clears throat> not only had one university, but really how do we help people in this next area of moving all those brilliant ideas out into biosciences, uh, maybe you could speak to that. Well, I think we'd all agree that the day of uh, stovepipes is over and that the old models don't apply to the next normal. And it's efforts like the Center of Excellence uh, uh, that the governor set up for Centers of Excellence. The university is a Center of Excellence for Bioscience. The Bioscience Authority is a statewide uh, organization that has 13 board members from all the Rio Grande Corridor, from Las Cruces, Socorro, Albuquerque, Santa Fe. It's gonna be an era of collaboration and coordination and cooperation. And I think that's the real role that all of the people on this call can play is that it's about getting things done. It's not about who gets the credit. It's about making a difference. And we have the intellectual capital in our state to do that. We have the organization set up to do that. So, you know, let's, let's move to the next level and let's have a mindset that that breeds success and celebrates who we are as a, as a state and uh, the institutions we have. That probably didn't answer your question, but I think that the overall idea is, you know, we need to work together as a state to make things happen. Great, thank you. Uh, Juanita, the quest next question was for you. And it was from Elsie Mayo. And the question is, what would you say is the magnitude of the investment gap to match uh, that opportunity gap you cited? 
And how would you sequence and prioritize attracting that kind of investment from outside of the state, assuming it would be prudent to go out to bigger pools? Well, I'm going to assume that we need bigger pools, period, whether they're homegrown, and I think that's part of the story, or from out of state. Uh, I, you know, quantifying that, I, you know, if I just have to think off the top of my head, in the biosciences industry, it would be wonderful to have maybe four additional funds that have $150 million under management. Uh, altogether. Now, those funds, I wouldn't expect to be invest exclusively in New Mexico. And I think an important point to realize here, and this is uh, really supported by the great le relocating that we've experienced as well, is this idea that that there are hard walls around the borders of our state. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Academic progress, anybody who's been in that world knows it's happening at multiple places at multiple times, but we can be a centerpiece for the things that we do especially well here, which is the synergy between the hard sciences and the, and the life sciences. And uh, it's, it's a really unique opportunity. So if we had these $450 million funds each, I would see them investing some here, some in the region, uh, they, we wouldn't, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a foolish to think about trying to, it just doesn't make any sense for anybody. But if we had that kind of activity here, we've got good deals to look at. So how can that happen? It can happen with funds like ours, bringing in co-investors from out of state in our, in our investments. And we're doing that. Uh, we're about to close on one that has a great new out-of-state investor joining us. And one thing when we're talking about collaboration, realize about venture capital, it is really, really unusual for a fund to invest by itself uh, in an investment. And that happens because of the need for collaboration with expertise. And it happens because of the need to have follow-on capital. So one answer how to prioritize that is something that's already happened, needs to, to just keep a pace and, and grow is bringing new investors with our current funds in. And then the State Investment Council has a program that's investing regionally and, and uh, nationally, two, two different programs, kind of a complicated story, but there's a part of the program where there's an incentive to invest in New Mexico and it takes the collaboration with funds like ours with those funds to really make some great investments. So that's how I would prioritize it. But I think anything we can do to highlight the state is the, and I truly believe this, it's just a huge opportunity for the investors. Uh, you just don't find this combination of expertise and technology and relatively low cost. Um, it's here and it's, it's letting the world know about it. Great, thank you. Next question is uh, for Sanjeev. Uh, it's from Anna Anziz and she thanks you for all the great work you're doing and would like you to share some tips on what works and what does not work for assessing the success of such a broad program like ECHO. And what metrics do you find particularly effective in attracting funding for a worldwide project focused on pure education? Thank you, Doug. I think um, overall in the world, we currently have about 3000 active networks operating, right? And they're in a very diverse fields, as I mentioned. The valuation of an echo is based on a specific network. So currently we have 406 peer reviewed publications showing that echo works and evaluation ranges all the way from professional satisfaction, reduced professional isolation of doctors, uh, increased knowledge. We can examine their electronic records and show their performance has improved. And as we showed, in hepatitis C and many people have shown in other disease areas, final patient outcomes improve. <clears throat> in the field of education, the outcomes have to be in stand, uh, better performance in standardized math or, or English tests and so on and so forth. So it, it's very highly specific for a network. Each network is very focused on one particular area and we have very, very robust evaluation frameworks which occur globally on how to evaluate echoes. Because in order to call something an echo, you have to do an impact evaluation. And of course, we've done that um, 406 times. In terms of getting funding 
So far, the U.S. government uh, has given about $1.5 billion of funding for ECHO projects in the various universities and have philanthropists have funded hundreds of millions for Africa and India. Uh, but um, in general, for anybody, uh, we have major grant writing teams who, who do that kind of work at RR. Uh, I, I'll just add one thing, Doug, to the last question about economic development. I think one of the most useful economic development echoes in, in the New Mexico could be an echo for public safety, where there is a collaboration between the executive branch, I'm talking about the governor's office, the, the legislative branch, there's a county government, city government, the federal government, where we all put our attention together on making Albuquerque and our cities and rural areas safer, uh, sharing best practices from other states, but also sharing resources with each other. And that's something that we would like to support. We don't need a grant for that. We would like to support that in New Mexico because I think it's one of the most critical things we can do. So that. That would be just uh, an additional answer to the question you asked last time, Doug. Uh, we already do public safety echoes in downtown, another one in Knob Hill, but those are local within Albuquerque. I'm talking about a much broader collaboration. Great. Thank you, Sanji. Dale, uh, one participant would like you to share a little bit more about smart cities and uh, how sensors would uh, connect and also whether uh, you see design thinking and system thinking uh, serving a role and whether we have that kind of capability here in Albuquerque. Well, we definitely have that capability here in Albuquerque. And actually Albuquerque has been identified as one of the uh, easier cities in our country to adopt smart city technology around transportation, um, and other parts of a smart city that you could uh, deploy. And, you know, a lot of the sensors that are gonna go into that technology were developed right here in good old Albuquerque, New Mexico, at Sandia National Labs. So we have all of the pieces in place um, and we're building the robust uh, infrastructure, broadband infrastructure throughout our community to accommodate that. And it's just a matter of time before smart cities is here. Um, probably some of you have heard my presentation around driverless cars and autonomous vehicles and how that's gonna change the way we all live and work. And Albuquerque's uh, teed up and, and could be a showcase for the rest of the world. All right, well, San Diego won that this year, Albuquerque next time. There you go, see? All right, so, uh, uh, Juanita, you get the last uh, comment and um, you were commenting on uh, Elsie Mayo's comment. And I wonder if you, and you, that was your view too. So maybe you could uh, share with everybody <laughs> what was in that paragraph and uh, uh, you get the final word for today because we only got three minutes left. Well, we're that's... trying to keep things on cue for Lisa. Uh, that, that, that's great. That's what I get for responding. Um, so you, she, uh, Elsie just said, I, I heard you say four more friends of 100 million bringing in new vets, or et cetera, et cetera. But I think the part I was responding to at the end is to raise a, awareness of New Mexico's opportunity for investment, for the investment community, its combination of expertise and technology and synergy between the hard and natural science. Is investors just don't know about this sleeper, and she says that right, and I said yes, I that's my view. All right, well you you've given Sanjeev because he's next in the batting order two minutes to answer. How does Echo build trust between participants? And uh, one problem is New Mexico is the lack of trust and perception of a zero sum game. Yeah, Doug, I think. Um... People have often asked me, you know, it's a, such a simple idea, why does ECHO work? And of course, ECHO is about democratization of expertise, democratization of implementation of expertise and best practices. But the primary reason ECHO works, and we've done research on this, is because it creates rust, respect, trust, communities of practice, love and empathy for each other's concerns, 
and collaboration. That is the primary reason Echo works. As I said, I've been doing it day and night for 18 years, and it happens naturally through understanding. Part of the reason of this distrust is we don't truly understand the other person's perspective. And so in the absence of good understanding, and Echo's method is what we call high frequency, low dose. That is, it's not like we share everything all at once and it's weekly. Once a week, we keep meeting around a specific problem and we keep discussing each other's concerns. Ultimately, it leads to greater understanding and that's how progress occurs. And uh, there's a lot of publications on this, happy to share with anyone who wants to write to me. I have put my email address in the chat. Great. Well, I want to thank the terrific three panelists that I got the privilege to hang out with and learn from. And uh, I do think, Sanjeev, and uh, we should put a challenge out if anybody's interested to use Echo as a platform on some of the things that were raised, because I think they would tie in nicely with Dale and Juanita uh, raised also. So uh, thank you all for being uh, here and presenting and the people and the participants who asked the terrific question. So back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Doug, and thank you to the panel. Uh, what an innovative um, session that we just had, really exciting. We will now have a break uh, until 2.30 and we'll come back for our final panel, which is the Northern Rio Grande Corridor Collaborative. This is perhaps a newer initiative that not so many folks are familiar with. So please tune back in at 2.30. Thank you. <laughs>